So just to give you a brief background on Anupam, he's from IIT Delhi. He's a growth stage technology investor at NGP, a global venture firm with $1 billion under management, and he focuses on the intersection of data, IoT, and machine intelligence. Anupam represents NGP on the boards of several companies as well. He has over 15 years of prior experience, operating product and investing experience in the technology industry, and has been associated with various iterations of big data, IoT, and AI over the years. He has a BS in computer science from IIT Delhi and UT Austin, respectively, and MBA from Wharton School as well. So I'm handing it over to Anupam to get this started. Great, thank you. Good morning, everyone. How's everyone doing? So, great. So we're talking autonomous vehicles. Let me begin with a quick question, if I can actually see you all. Uh, uh, how many people here have been inside an autonomous vehicle? All right, maybe about 20%, 30%. Uh, let me ask it a different way. It's, it's a little bit of, it was a little bit of a trick a question, a little bit of a throwback to quizzes and minors at IIT. Uh, because let me ask you a different way. How many have been here have been inside air train at SFO airport or one of the other airports or inside an airplane? That's pretty much all of us. So, uh, you know, a lot of those are also autonomous systems, very contained, but autonomous vehicles, you know, planes uh, fly for about 95% of the time or more in autonomous mode uh, and so on. So, so that's, uh, uh, that's the topic we'll be talking about today. And we have a very illustrious panel here, very... Uh, deep domain expertise across different parts of the stack. So why don't I request them to, starting with Ashutosh, to just give us a very quick overview of their background and their interest in the space. Hi, I am Ashutosh. I graduated from IIT Kanpur 2004, and then I started doing artificial intelligence PhD at Stanford University. Um, it's quite a while in academia, being a, being a professor where I did projects involving making AI algorithms and automations for people's different activities. So currently, um, I am the founder and CEO of a company called Casper.ai, where we build automation algorithms for people in physical spaces, such as homes um, and cars, where you can model people on what they do, how they behave, how they act, and make them make automation work for them. Thank you. Shilpa. Hi, I'm Shilpa. I graduated from IIT Bombay. Um, following that, I did my PhD in robotics where I worked on autonomous wheelchairs. Uh, I specifically worked on the reasoning and planning part of those. During my PhD, I also worked on a NASA-sponsored project to build an underwater uh, autonomous vehicle. That was a prototype that would go on Jupiter's moon, Europa. And I was one of the few lucky people on this planet to have been to Antarctica and have camped there in the coldest, driest places on the Earth to test a robot. Thank you. Uh, that was, I think, the most fun I've ever had. Um, following that, I worked at Bosch, uh, working on their autonomous driving, again in planning and predictions. After that, I joined Apple, um, where I was a, a senior manager, where I built a team of about 30 people working in AI. I cannot uh, reveal what we did at Apple. Um, <laughs> um, we'll talk about that later. <laughs> Um, so right now I'm in a transition period. I'm going to join a startup uh, in a c couple of weeks. It's a startup in the Bay Area in the robotic space. Thank you. Uh, okay. So I'm uh, Vijay Narkarni. Uh, I am from IIT Bombay as well. Uh, and I spent the first half of my career in uh, working in very, very big companies. And I spent a second half of my career working in startups. So I got a pretty good mix of the two. Uh, what I do uh, currently is I head uh, artificial intelligence for uh, for autonomous driving and for infotainment at a company called Visteon. Uh, we are a tier one auto uh, motor supplier, uh, which is headquartered in Detroit, but uh, we have an office over here that, that I run. Uh, and uh, uh, we are focused on uh, uh, the various technologies for, uh, uh, for image classification uh, and for path planning uh, to help uh, automotive, uh, to, to help uh, automotive uh, to, to help automobiles uh, uh, navigate and uh, uh, traverse uh, roads, highways, and such. Thank you. So let's let's start with maybe some uh, level setting on the uh, 
you know, what, what are we talking about in terms of autonomous driving and the phases of, uh, you know, so there's a, a way it's been presented by various NHTSA and others on levels of autonomous driving, uh, but there are other ways to look at it. So where are we in that path of getting to, let's say, fully autonomous vehicles as you would define it, and uh, where do you see ourselves right now in that curve, and what is, uh, how do you actually define autonomous vehicles as I was trying to make a uh, small joke earlier around, you know, there are these contained autonomous systems that are already out there maybe for 30, 40 years, but uh, then there are these more complex open systems which are, are going to take longer. But maybe starting with Ashutosh, why don't you go first? What, how do you see autonomous driving longer term? What do you, how do you see that as and where are we in the journey to that? So I think uh, we as humans are pretty lazy people. That's why we like automation. When automation starts doing things for us and sometimes even better, we see more and more automation creeping into our lives. So as you mentioned, like for the flights, uh, it's a very simple environment where the perception problem, which is to see what is going on in the environment is a simple problem. So the problem becomes of planning, how to go from point A to point B, and some problems and you can fly the plane or a, or a, or a train at San Francisco station, uh, which we have seen in the past. But when you get into self-driving cars, there is a couple of other technically challenging problems that happen. And one of them is people. You are driving on road with people who are walking around. There are other cars on the road which have their own agenda. They are distracted drivers who may do things which are not following the rules of the road. And that makes uh, self-driving cars quite a challenging problem. So, so far, we have seen some development in some demonstrations that cars can go from point A to point B following the maps using the camera images. But I think there's a lot of work to be done to make it really work in human environments. Uh, yeah, let yeah. me add to that. Uh, so basically in uh, autonomous driving, it is generally uh, an easier task to go from say, uh, scratch to the 99% level. Uh, and a lot of companies have done that. It is incredibly hard to go from 99% to 99.99%, and that is really where you sort of need to be, uh, because uh, you cannot really, as, a, as a, an, an autonomous vehicle, you cannot afford to uh, you know, miss every thousand stop sign, for example, or you cannot afford to crash into every 10,000th car. Uh, so that basically becomes you know, one of the key things that companies are trying to solve. So getting the right level of, I would say, uh, accuracy or being able to handle uh, the myriad of corner cases that you have, uh, that is uh, uh, where the challenge really is. Uh, and that is, uh, companies that crack that code uh, will do actually very well. Companies that don't uh, will have a harder time. Mm -hmm. And I can speak about two key technologies that uh, enable self-driving cars. We are making progress in both directions, but we are still far from full autonomy. So if you look at full autonomy, we can imagine a scenario in India where there are cows sitting on the road, the traffic is completely ran random, and we can get, go all the way to Germany where we drive on autobahn, everything is very regular. And tr a true autonomous agent needs to be able to handle all this complexity. The complexity arises from occlusion. We cannot always see everything, no matter how good the sensors are. Um, it arises from uh, relative randomness in the world in the sense that we cannot predict what every other object in the world is going to do. Um, so these two problems, uh, I would say, of partial observability and stochasticity make self-driving cars a truly challenging problem. So in terms of perception, we have made a you know, lot of uh, progress with deep neural nets. And as Ashutosh said, planning and prediction are still very much largely open and unsolved problems that can scale to all these situations. Interesting. So I'm hearing some agreement here or some commonality in thought in terms of a lot of things now that need to be addressed. And uh, yet I think there are these uh, you know, various companies, including uh, some of the auto OEMs and some of the leading uh, you know, uh, the, the Silicon Valley companies, they've gone out and put a stake in the ground and said, uh, anyway, from starting from 2018 or 19 uh, to 2021, five years from now, you've seen that all those different announcements from different groups saying, we're going to have an autonomous vehicle on the roads. So thoughts on that, is that mostly marketing or is that a way to rally their troops uh, and somehow get something out by that time? Do you think it's happening? Uh, so I actually think that uh, what you'll start seeing is the industry evolving in stages. Uh, getting to a full autonomy where you have completely driverless vehicles doing, you know, like taxis picking you up from your home and taking you to the airport. Uh, I think that we are a little ways off from that, although there are companies like Uber and so on who are trying to do exactly that. 
but I think uh, for the most part, what we'll start to see is companies that do, uh, you know, uh, that take, uh, I would say, smaller steps. And uh, you'll see things like, for example, uh, driverless self-parking in garages. Uh, you'll see uh, uh, cars or, or trucks that essentially go on highways uh, all by themselves completely autonomously. Uh, there are uh, smaller things uh, where the problems are simpler, and those will get uh, solved faster. Uh, and I think that is really the way the industry will evolve. So I think uh, uh, self-driving car is not a single problem. It is a platform just like just to take a bad example, like a smartphone with three or four or 10 different apps. In this case of self-driving car, I agree with him that one of the apps is like, okay, a car that can go into a garage and self-park. So we have, I think the commercial forces are so great that we are going to see specific pieces and parts being automated. And I believe that there are some special commercial uses which are extremely valuable, like truck driving, which is tedious and it takes a long time, it may get automated. Highway driving may happen before city driving. Um, parking example, as he mentioned, will happen earlier because those are the more tedious parts. So we are going to see this car as a platform where you can download these uh, add-ons and subscribe to them. We already see them in some of the cars like Tesla. Yeah, and also to add to Ashutosh, one of the e easier domains is low speed. Um, so in this case, you don't carry a human driver, but you just transport goods, and it's going to be very, very low speeds, which is happening in uh, some of the startups in Europe are already doing that. So we're talking basically more, um, so there's, I guess, two or three different threads there, and maybe we'll explore them shortly one by one. So one is uh, Ashutosh talked about sort of more human augmentation, so you're helping the driver just ease out some of these tasks. The other is getting to more contained environments where the environment is more well-defined and contained and then you don't have a lot of those complexities of an unknown environment. And uh, so there are different ways of uh, getting to that vision. But let's get that in a minute. Let's do a very quick couple of rapid fire questions here to uh, just put a specific, some specific numbers on things. Uh, you know, first is how many years till we have commercial fully autonomous vehicles uh, on the road? where there's not a driver in the seat, maybe there's no uh, wheel uh, as well in the car. How many years, you know, 5, 10, 20, 50, what, uh, just put a number. Eight. Eight. <laughs> Kilpa. <laughs> no, that's respect for that, yeah. Uh, we'll make it happen. Between, between seven and 10. Okay. Marketing G demos right now, certain states, it will happen in less than five years, but full autonomous driving everywhere will take 10 years. I, so I do not give a single answer. Wow, okay, so, so <laughs> I guess uh, that, that those are And a distinction yeah. between mar marketing demos and real products, right? As, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I wouldn't see if you want the marketing answer or the real answer. Right, yeah, no, real, real answer. <laughs> Everything here uh, today is real, so. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So uh, let me ask the audience maybe, uh, you know, uh, so three categories, right? Less than five, five, or actually maybe let's make uh, less than 10, 10 to 20, more than 20. <laughs> uh, for fully co uh, autonomous commercial vehicle without a wheel, without a driver, uh, commercial vehicle that you can go and buy or get a service from, or get a, you know, just transportational service right from, how many years till it's on the road? Uh, less than 10 years, how many people? Okay, bunch of people, uh, 10 to 20? Wow, so almost half the people in that, and then 20 plus years? Okay, so we have over 10% <laughs> of the people, the, the realists uh, in that bucket. Now what you should do is uh, ask that to a Google audience. What's that? Now you should ask that to a Google audience. That's right. <laughs> then we'll get the marketing answer, or you get a marketing we, we need answer, the, yeah. <laughs> uh, so we get, need to get them at a conference like this and ask uh, for the real answer. But uh, I guess second, uh, then maybe flip side of that question, how many years till it becomes illegal for humans to drive? <laughs> <laughs> Who wants to go first? That is a very interesting question. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's the politically correct answer. <laughs> okay, I mean, uh, we won't hold I you to personally, it. Personally, I don't think uh, it'll be illegal for quite a while, uh, at least uh, 70 to 100 years. 70 to 100 years, yeah. okay. Yeah, I would give it two generations. Wouldn't put an exact number, but okay. at least two generations yeah. since the first self-driving cars. So in that uh, sort of 50 to 100 year time frame then? Yeah. Okay. And depends on how it evolves. If there are some dedicated self-driving highways, then we will see people not being allowed to drive on those highways because human okay. error is the biggest error on highway accidents. 
Uh, I think if you look at the statistics, like very few errors have, uh, accidents happen because you know car blew out or there was a bottle because people make mistakes. Yeah. So we may see it earlier actually, I think. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. Especially on highways. Or we may see okay. newly built cities that just never have humans. They just have autonomous cars. <laughs> <laughs> there may be special environments where yes. uh, humans are not allowed to I think we, I think we what... overrate human yeah. abilities. We do. Yeah. yeah. So I think, I think <laughs> AI is getting better than humans. Yeah. And that's why it may become illegal for humans to drive, right? right? And, I think it uh, may happen in less than 20, 25 years, actually. I think so, uh, you make a good point, though. I think uh, there will be, uh, in, at some point in the future, maybe about 20 years from now, uh, a completely parallel set of highways or uh, I would say uh, roadways for autonomous vehicles uh, where there is no other type of vehicle but, auto but autonomous. Uh, but uh, there's, al there's already a big infrastructure today uh, and we, it's all over. Uh, we, we travel it every single day, right? And that won't go away anytime soon. It's sort of like in Minority Report where you saw uh, the old infrastructure and the new one all coexisting. Yeah. I think that'll happen. So, uh, great. Can I add to that? Yeah. I think we are already seeing we not being allowed to drive on the roads already. My car right now doesn't pulls off the accelerator if you're trying to back up into a wall. It already does that. So it's already overruling my decisions slowly, slowly, and slowly. So that's why I believe it will happen much faster than what we are thinking. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Great. So yeah, if, and I've, if I were to answer those two questions, I think the uh, to answer the second one first, I'll answer it in an equation. It's 10, t plus 10, where T is the time when the first one happens, I think, within 10 years. So I'll, I'm in Ashutosh's camp that way. And on T, I'm actually more in the realist camp. I think it's going to be a while before you have a fully autonomous vehicles that, vehicle that goes anywhere. I think you'll see, uh, my view is you'll see self-driving, uh, a lot of augmentation happen first. Uh, but that's just one man's view. Now, now the most important rapid fire question is, how long before auto rickshaws in Delhi and Bombay turn into autonomous rickshaws? <laughs> that's a now joke. You're, now you're stretching it. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Let's, let's dig deeper into, I think, two of those thoughts that came out from the previous thread on um, some of the uh, ways how we, you know, the steps leading up to autonomous driving, right? And the contained environments, for instance, is one which, um, uh, you know, which is really interesting because I think that's here and now something you can actually start investing behind and start building behind. So maybe uh, uh, starting with, uh, uh, with uh, Vijay on, uh, if you were to just pick one uh, sort of contained environment, a use case where you think uh, you could see a fully autonomous system deployed, which is not there today, uh, which you see as an opportunity area, and then... then uh, I, I actually think that uh, that is one, and uh, I think it's going to be long distance transportation, uh, specifically trucks that need to go long distances to uh, you know, deliver goods and whatnot. Uh, uh, so that's more in the human augmentation camp where there's a driver still in the truck, but the driver is uh, right. sort of uh, not having to drive and it's on the... Right, the truck uh, because is the highway the brings highway. a certain number of simplifications with it in terms of you know, what the autonomous vehicle needs to do. There are no pedestrians, there are no intersecting streets, uh, there are, uh, uh, no, you don't have to worry about traffic lights, traffic signs, that, that sort of thing. So uh, what you need to do mainly on for long distance you know, journeys is focus more on keeping your lane and then adjust to congestion, adjust to make, making lane changes, things like that. Uh, those are uh, simpler problems to tackle and they will get tackled a little faster. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Shilpa? Any, um, any uh, I think we would first go for low speed goods transportation. And the reason I say is if you look at history, uh, let's say we, uh, when we built, um, you know, shuttles, space shuttles, spaceships, we first sent animals. When we do human study, when we do studies of drugs, we first experiment on animals and not on <coughs> humans. So even in the case of the driving space, we will first experiment on cargo. Because in that case, you can tolerate a lot many failures than in the case of carrying a human, even also at low speeds. But let me question that a little bit. Aren't yeah. there other people involved? So if you're driving on the road, uh, yes. you know, there's many more other lives at stake as well. If you're yes. on a red light with cargo, you know, it's the uh, Absolutely. person you're going to T-bone that's also at risk. But the deal with cargo is um, uh, what I'm saying is we don't go at the high speed trucking. We go at a low speed cargo delivery. So for example, if you want Amazon, or Whole Foods to deliver something to your door. You have low-speed bots that can navigate on one side of the road. They carry the cargo and they deliver it. And if they are low you speed- on sidewalks or something like that? On like sidewalks. Delivery, uh, delivery that yeah. Makes sense. They could yeah. drive on roads too, but low speed. Mm -hmm. In that case, you can build uh, lots of, let's say, protective mechanisms around them. You can make very robust collision avoidance, but you don't have to worry about the comfort of the passenger. Okay, that makes sense. So last mile cargo and deliveries. Yeah. 
Ashutosh, any uh, specific contained environments where fully autonomous systems can be deployed? You know, I think uh, on the contained environment question, I don't have anything to add beyond. Uh, so maybe the augment, let's uh, then get into the second, which is the aug augmented, and you talked about that a little bit earlier. Uh, so if you were to pick a couple of other such use cases which are not there today, in the next five years, you think they'll make driving a lot simpler. Uh, uh, what would those be? So I think uh, uh, generally what has happened in uh, parallel products is, uh, like parallel spaces such as whatever we do in our lives, uh, we have a tendency to get really, really bored with certain things, right? Uh, and, and if you take two hours of driving every day, what is the most boring part? Um, uh, finding a parking in a parking garage structure, uh, driving on a highway. And, and I think every single time even we will see starts parts of this automation creeping in in the cars. So you're driving on the highway. Right now, if you try to change a lane, it doesn't affect your steering wheel. It only gives you a warning, a red warning, when you're trying to go out. And very soon, like for example, the, one of the projects I did while I was teaching at Stanford was to see the driver. And the driver dozes off because he may be sleepy, and you start veering off the road. And we may see actually the car taking over and not allowing you to change the lanes in such situations. And that's a very, very... Uh, game theoretic aspect where the AI is trying to work with humans and sometimes trying to step over the human's toes, sometimes not. And we are going to see this coming in slowly in different aspects of driving. Not being able to change lanes, not being able to merge if there is a car right next to you, um, not being able to accelerate or you have to push accelerator really hard if there is a red light or a pedestrian in front of you. And then slowly it will take over, I think. That's a, one of the ways we will see autonomous driving happening. Yeah, great, that makes sense. So maybe then moving into, uh, since we have a, a you know, audience which has some engineers, hopefully uh, some uh, are engineers, um, <laughs> more than some, but um, maybe uh, talking about the technical aspect of to get to level uh, four or five, four or five autonomy, you know, however you define it, uh, what are the hardest technical challenges right now that need to be solved and are, be, or, you know, and, and are being worked upon? Maybe starting with Shilpa. Mm -hmm. uh, so in my experience, so there are two hard problems, uh, as we gently touched upon already. So what, first is the problem of perception, which is the ability to see all the objects that exist in the world, uh, put geometric shapes on them, and also classify them, saying that this is a car, this is a bush, um, and also be able to um, uh, model the infrastructure elements. So for example, traffic light detection, lane detection. So that's the perception side. And huge advances have been made in using deep neural nets. And I believe if we continue down that track, this problem will get solved to a large extent. On the other side is the planning and prediction problem. So planning essentially means looking into the future and planning what decisions are optimizing a cost function and what should be the motion of the car. Planning essentially is a geometric problem. It involves geometry and dynamics. But at the same time, to plan in the future, we need to predict the world. Um, we need to predict how the world is likely to evolve, given the information we have. And prediction itself, as we know as humans, prediction is a terribly hard problem. As humans, we have not done very well at predicting most things, except perhaps weather, which, in, you know, which we are able to do. So prediction, I believe, is the key to unlocking the uh, uh, full autonomy problem. And it's a challenging problem. Uh, we might end up using you know, deep neural nets or data-driven approaches for prediction. There is a lot to be done in that domain. Yeah. Anything to add to the Ashutosh? And you were mentioning earlier the uh, human uh, and AI interaction piece. And related to that is this human error issue, right? While you're driving a car, you're also trying to provide for other people's errors. So if you had a completely empty road, I think that'd be fairly easy to program. Yeah, yeah. Think, think of that as like Go++ plus plus, uh, dealing with humans, right? On the real environment. So Go board is a, I can play a game of seven by seven, but I lose in front of a computer of, of a board larger than that. And AlphaGo has beaten the largest player uh, of, of Go game. So dr driving is like that, with like 10 players on the road, and the prediction problem is challenging not only because it's geometric, because humans are unpredictable, and we still have to figure out on how do we design that interaction between the people mm -hmm. and on the machines. That is the most challenging part, I think, in fully autonomous driving. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and do you think uh, there is sort of a, you know the uh, with with the aircraft uh, space? If you look at it, you know one of the 
supporting elements, there is a global ATC system and GPS and a lot of coordinate systems. So is there a both opportunity and need for something like that, which would be which might be actually required before you can have fully autonomous vehicles? Anyone who wants to? Uh, well, uh, there is this new area uh, called HD Maps, and uh, I think we're finding more and more that HD Maps is going to be fairly critical uh, for autonomous driving because uh, what you really need is a blend of the car following the map with some pretty good precision to the to the lane keeping level, uh, and combine that with. Uh, reinforcement learning to uh, essentially uh, negotiate obstacles or, or to make lane changes and things like that. So I think the, the right blend of the two is uh, going to be not just important but also crucial. Uh, and I think uh, vehicles that uh, do not really have a good, uh, I would say, GPS-based uh, uh, system uh, that is precise to maybe about, say, 10 centimeters thereabout, uh, may have a bit of a hard time uh, because you can't rely only on, uh, I would say, perception. You have to also rely on uh, the, the knowledge of where the vehicle is uh, with some precision. So in aircraft systems, uh, you not only follow this positioning system, there is actually a very robust aircraft collision detection system which is completely local. You don't, even if satellites go down, planes can figure out if you're close to each other. So a parallel of that is in the cars also. Hmm. You need both. You need maps, which helps a lot, especially in highway driving. Uh, but you know, there could be a random car just coming and running into the other car. So mm -hmm. some, the, the computer has to do something. Yeah. So then maybe changing gears into um, th uh, you know, the, there's a bunch of different stakeholders and different companies that have entered the space in the last two three years and have gotten really very active. So there is obviously all the large uh, tech giants who really sparked a lot of this over the last eight to ten years. That you know, Google, Tesla, Apple. Uh, then there is the fleet uh, type companies, you know, uh, Uber uh, obviously being the foremost amongst those. And then there's obviously all the auto OEMs uh, who are who now need to keep up with this and also maybe stay go ahead of that and get ahead of all of these. And 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 there is you know a bunch of others in the space, a lot of software AI tech enablers. Uh, where do you see who you know uh, who do you see best position? Uh, obviously, no one has the final, but uh, you know. Uh, in your views, who would be who do you see as best position? Given you need a combination of technology, a fleet that you can experiment on, lots of data. There's a lot of things. Do you need the whole ecosystem? Uh, which of these would you see, say out of the gate a better position to uh, to uh, to actually crack the puzzle first? Uh, so with, I think I think yeah. I think basically uh, the industry is such that a startup cannot by itself, uh, unless it's very very well funded, like Tesla, for example. Uh, make a, a mark entirely by itself. So uh, any startup that is there uh, can invent the technology, and they have remarkable technology, many of them. But to really uh, have it be, have it go into the industry, I think they need to find some OEM or some big brother, uh, so to speak, uh, to, to, to partner with. And I think uh, you're seeing some of that as in, uh, you know, uh, for example, companies like Auto or companies like Cruise Automation or Argo. I mean, uh, they essentially have either got bought or they have, they have, they've been funded by some of the largest OEMs in the market. Uh, and I think you'll see more and more of that happening. Uh, in terms of uh, where the market goes, obviously there are the tech giants, like you mentioned, like uh, you know, Google, Amazon, uh, Apple, actually even Microsoft is getting in the game right now, or has got in the game. And uh, they are obviously uh, trying to produce their own technology. Now, one thing that matters in a big way in this is to have a presence in the car. So the OEMs, obviously, they make the car. So by definition, they have their own cars to have a presence in. But uh, the, the tech giants like Google or, or well, Google is, uh, has Waymo, but let's, let's take Apple or let's take you know, some others like Microsoft. Uh, for them, uh, it's very, very important to get a presence in the car. And it's not through, say, uh, Android Auto or through Apple CarPlay. It, it has to be something more fundamental. Uh, and I think uh, they are working toward that right now. Uh, in terms of uh, who will succeed in the long term, I actually think the tech giants, because they tend to be more creative, uh, have the edge on that basis. But as of today, uh, the auto OEMs, in my opinion, uh, are not giving up that easily. And uh, they are trying to sort of avoid what happened with, uh, with the Blackberries and the Nokias of the world. And they want, to avoid, they want to avoid those mistakes. So uh, you'll see a lot of uh, partnerships happening. And I think those partnerships ultimately, you know, those who have good sustaining partnerships will in fact rule. 
Yeah. Does anyone, if you have a different view? On that? I think uh, tech giants. this is such a, I, I don't want to answer whether tech giants will win or we it's have to. not. Yeah. <laughs> so I think it is going to be startups and new areas because it's such a big area. Like I was not born then, but 1960s, I think whole countries were made, whole economies were made because there were cars and trains and flights. And when you're making a car, you make the engine, you make the steering wheel, it's a whole, you know, millions of people get jobs. So with AI and self-driving cars, everything is going to flip over. And we are just seeing the beginning here. And we are not realizing it. Like as things change, as the last minute delivery trucks, highways are going to change, AI software, sensors, there's going to be whole sleuth of startups which we are not even yet started to figure out what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. And it will be a big fun time over the next two decades. Yeah, I will add a little bit to what you are saying. So I think there is, it's not a zero sum game. Every, uh, all of these players have different things to offer. What startups offer is that they offer tight-knit groups of really smart people who can work together fast on the core algorithms and the technologies. What OEMs offer is their traditional knowledge of safety and validation. We, we really need expertise in that. And what tech giants offer is they offer the ability to make products, make integrated products. And uh, this landscape changes so fast, I believe uh, people will keep moving from one to the other. They will transfer knowledge. Like for example, I moved from OEM to uh, tech giant to startup. People like me will move around and we will build up an expertise in the industry overall. And that's where ultimately we will have a solution to this problem. Okay, rapid fire question, one word answer. Uh, whose self-driving program is the furthest ahead right now? <laughs> Google. Google, way more. I'll change the question. Second, who's number two? Because <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a well. Uh, Tesla. I would agree. Tesla. Ashutosh. Uh, I, I, think, I think Google or Tesla may be far ahead, but I think there are a lot of startups who are doing things okay. that they haven't yet announced. Great. Yes. Excellent. So um, I'm being told we, are, we have only a couple of minutes left here. So why don't we open up uh, to one or two questions here? Yeah. Thanks, Asatos, for a great panel. Uh, I have one particular question. Great discussion on technology. Wanted to understand the financial viability of autonomous cars, of, of a particular uh, use case which Silpa has brought up, which is low-speed commercial vehicles. When do you think they will become commercially viable compared to the alternatives which we have on the road right now? Because these autonomous vehicles are going to cost a lot of money, and it will have a whole ecosystem around it. Have you guys given a thought about it or want to share some information with the audience? So when, does, when do they become commercially viable? Yeah, financial possible? viability of autonomous cars, especially for low speed commercial applications. I'm making it more specific than keeping it a okay. general question. Oh, got it, got it, for low speed commercial applications. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's a spectrum. So for example, I was recently reading about a startup that has uh, built robots that carry your luggage for you, or groceries for you. So they walk behind you on a pavement, uh, and they are specially applicable in Europe because people walk around a lot. Um, and those things, they require very low level of technology. It's just reactive behaviors. And I think they are very, within two to three years, we can easily have products in that. Uh, if you go one level up where it's like actual delivery for say, for example, like Instacart, that might be in the next four to five years. I, I think this is a more tractable problem than uh, let's say um, fully autonomous driving, carrying people. Makes sense, thank you, Silva, thank you. Hi, I'm Raj Shah, IIT Bombay. Uh, you partly answered my question. My question is about the byproducts of all the work that's happening in autonomous vehicles. So the example you took um, about delivery from you know, Whole Foods, uh, slow-moving cars uh, or vehicles, and then the, the example of shopping carts. But that was my question. What are other things you can, you can think of? I mean, I've started seeing things like delivery systems in hospitals that are automatically delivering, you know, uh, um, um, you know, uh, things from lab to uh, uh, samples from, from uh, to one department to another department. So my question is, what are other such examples of byproducts of uh, this work? Mm -hmm. uh, I actually think that uh, uh, there's a market for uh, vehicles that uh, are in, say, closed circuit uh, uh, commutes. For example, in an airport, that uh, the shuttle bus that goes uh, really from terminal to terminal into the rental car lot and back to the terminals. I think there's a market for that. 
uh, and that can be extended to other areas, uh, like for example, in the college campuses, for example, uh, a vehicle that will go and pick up uh, the students from their dorms and take them to their classes and then back. Uh, so I think that is the market which uh, I believe uh, has, has, has a, uh, a near-term future. Uh, and then also uh, uh, vehicles that may not be on the open road, but maybe in, say, warehouses, uh, which we don't look at as autonomous vehicles, but they are. Uh, and they will essentially uh, you know, pick up goods or whatever it is from various locations and bring them to uh, like the manufacturing, the, the place where they're manufactured, uh, or, 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 or conversely, uh, take finished goods and take them to, uh, to the place where they're loaded onto the truck. I think things like that will, uh, will happen. I think some of them have already happened, like Amazon bought Kiva for warehouse automation to move boxes around. So they are using it almost many of their warehouses. So we will see it more in shopping uh, malls where they have your cart may actually follow you around um, and, and so on and so forth. So small little applications like that. Yeah, I think hospitals too, just carrying around uh, medications, nurses spend a lot of time doing that. Yeah, uh, I am Ravi. So, uh, what are your thoughts on like uh, an autonomous vehicle, like uh, communicating its intent? Like, I want to take the lane next to me, or I want to take the next like uh, 50 feet ahead of me in the next two minutes. Like, kind of communicate that intent to to human drivers or to humans who are driving like the other cars on the road. Predicting like where they are going to go is probably harder than like saying, okay, this is where I am going. You don't want to get hit. No, I think I think a prediction of uh, other agents in the environment is a basic part of any autonomous system, uh, and it has to be done. You are playing chess; it you have to, to predict the other person doing, and uh, and you are living in an, the car is driving in a human environment, so it, it has to yes, predict. Yes, but yeah. in in you're saying in human with like yeah, uh, kind of like in an extreme case, kind of like color the part of the road red or whatever. Say yes. I'm going to take it. I do think communicating the intent is important. Uh, from the small amount of studies I did with users when I was at Bosch, uh, this is one of the very key, uh, key requirements of gaining user trust, both within the car and outside the car. Um, and I believe over time, we might just have standard protocols of communication of how self-driving cars communicate their intent. Okay. And it may not happen as much in California. Here, people are loath to even <laughs> give indicators when they're uh, you know, changing into a lane. That's so. true. <laughs> thank you. OK, last question, I think. We have time for. Hi, guys. Thank you for the interesting uh, discussion. I had a question about the autonomous industry and what the industry could do to stay ahead of the curve, whether it's in the market or strategy as a product or technology side of things. I think there is a lot of opportunity in different spaces. As I was mentioning, whenever a new industry arises, there is a lot of small pieces, secondary suppliers, vendors that have to be developed. So I think it's a great opportunity for people to watch out. There are things going to happen in AI, IoT, self-driving cars, and smart homes, and all that. What can people do to make new software? What new sensors could be made? What new highway support industries could be made? So Several areas in construction, <coughs> hardware development, transportation, software are going to change. And one can watch out for many of those opportunities. Right. Specifically in some things that you might want to say that this is a very interesting area which would really help move ahead, given the current stage of development you see already. Um, so I would identify two key areas which can really, uh, let's say, accelerate autonomy. So one would be developing a way to annotate data at scale, because that is really uh, required for perception algorithms. And then the other one is developing a good simulation environment, because that is a key to testing the algorithms before you go on the road. And it saves, um, it saves millions of hours of real life driving. Yeah, I would actually completely support that, because uh, we haven't talked about it a whole lot here. But uh, making the systems uh, bulletproof and fail safe is critical. Uh, the car, uh, I mean, it's said very commonly that a car is a perfect killing machine. Uh, so, uh, uh, and uh, whatever can be done uh, to make the car safer and reliable uh, is going to be not just important, but it's, it's going to be what determines the success of the industry. Thank you very much. Great. So I think we've had a really good panel discussion here. And in summary, I think it sounds like uh, you know, a lot of hard problems to be solved till we get to some of these full autonomy type uh, 
uh, outcomes, but I think a lot of interesting steps along the way, a lot of interesting opportunities that you can actually address here and now with the next five, seven year horizon and uh, build interesting companies or interesting products around. And uh, one thing I've wondered is, uh, it, this is actually a space where there's relatively few IITNs, and I've wondered why that is, and maybe is that because we, uh, most of us grew up in India, you know, seeing the traffic there, we can't imagine self-driving cars <laughs> or something. Uh, but, but I think it'll be great, uh, you know, I think there's a lot of opportunities for many of us to start companies and invest in companies and um, enter that space. So thanks a lot for being a great audience, and thanks a lot to the panelists here. Sure, sure. Thank you.